Welcome to the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers Spotlight on the Issues webinar series. I'm your host, Jason Modulin, the president of the Alliance. It's my honor to be with you today. The Texas Alliance of Energy Producers represents over 2,600 individuals and member companies that are focused on advancing independent operators and the standards of the Texas oil and gas industry. Through advocacy for smart energy and environmental policy, effective communications, and cost-saving insurance programs, the Alliance delivers for our members. This year, the Alliance is celebrating our 90th anniversary. Founded in 1930 in Wichita Falls as the North Texas Oil and Gas Association, we merged with the West Central Texas Oil and Gas Association from Abilene in 2000 and expanded our focus statewide, adding members from across the state. While we celebrate our past, we are firmly focused on the future delivering solutions for Texas independent operators. A special thanks to our President's Forum sponsors today, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Marathon Oil for making these events possible. I would now like to call on our board chairman, Cy Wagner, to get us started. She is a dynamic leader, a second generation oil producer, an Aggie petroleum engineer who is at the helm of her family's 40 year oil and gas business in Fort Worth. Cy, would you like to make a few remarks? Thank you, Jason. On behalf of the board and the membership of the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Craddock and all of our viewers. Commissioner Craddock, thank you for your time and insight today. The Alliance is proud to support the commission in their effective efforts for regulatory policy from the small mom and pop operators, the service companies and the large publicly traded entities that our membership represents. We thank you for your efforts on our behalf. Thank you to our for board and members for joining in today. We look forward to seeing all of you again soon in our next spotlight on the issues. We will continue to bring you these events to keep you updated on the issues that are facing each of us and our businesses. Stay tuned to your Alliance email updates and be sure to register for our next event. Thank you, Jason and the staff for your work in bringing this event to our members. Let's get started. Thank you, Cy, very much. And thank you for your leadership. And I also saw Towns Pressler and Marianne Williamson on here from our board. So thank you very much for being here. Hi, Commissioner. I'll do your intro real quick. Our guest today is Commissioner Christy Craddock. Commissioner Craddock is at the forefront of the newest wave of conservatives in leadership roles in Texas, raised in a strong conservative household, retained as legal counsel by prominent Texas firms, and shaped by more than a decade as a trusted political advisor. Craddock has set a clear standard of integrity, self-reliance, and innovation in her position as Commissioner at the Railroad Commission. Since her tenure on the commission began in November 2012, Craddock has pushed to maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of an energy industry that is driving the state's unparalleled economic success. In the process, she has repeatedly proven that sensible regulations, careful listening, and plain talk can foster innovation that has solidified Texas leadership in the energy sector. A native of Midland, the heart of the Permian Basin, Craddock earned both her bachelor's degree as a Plan II graduate and her Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Texas at Austin. During her career as an attorney, she specialized in oil and gas, water, tax issues, electric deregulation, and environmental policy. If you'd like to submit a question to Commissioner Craddock, please utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will go till about 2.30 and wrap up with a few audience questions. Commissioner Craddock, welcome. How are you doing today? Oh, well, thanks. So thanks for the intro since you wrote it when we have to refresh it at some point. Uh, so thank you for having me and thanks for the Alliance. So the best thing y'all have done in a while is hire Jason. That was not good for my world, but we've replaced well, I think with Mia, if you don't know Mia, but Jason's doing a great job and it's nice to be among some friends when you were rattling off some of your board members, people I've known for a long time. You have a great group of people you work with. And thank y'all for having me today. So I thought I'd start by saying, wow, what a ride for the last six months. Um, Jason, I think, was glad to get him out of my office and move to the Alliance. He got to be with me through, and he was nice and stayed an extra month, by the way. Thank y'all for letting him stay as we were going through some stuff through the spring. So I thought I'd back up and say the last six months have been 
very unusual and we are not finished, I don't think, as far as what this industry is going through, but we're surviving. And I think that tells a lot about what this industry is and frankly, what we do as an agency. So if, uh, if you wanna back up to March and I always wanna tell people about prorationing for a minute because it was the most talked about thing Nobody had anything else to do, so they all watched us, right? And so it's the most talked about thing, I think, in this industry for, uh, for a long time, all through the spring. And it started about spring break for me, and how do I remember? Because I was trying to go on spring break with my daughter and started getting phone calls about the fact that, had we ever prorated? And, I, and we, could we prorate? And I said, well, that was 1973 that we really did it. And Nobody really is still alive or works at the agency for sure who knows how to do it anymore. And we've got to go figure that out. And by the time that was on a Thursday, by the time we got to Sunday, it was not only are we going to ask you to prorate, but we think the price of oil is going to go negative. Both of which happened, by the way. And so um, I think this has been a historic spring. And look, we, the, the, 10, 11 hour Zoom meeting that we had with 29,000 people on it during a long day in April, uh, which was really an important day. I took, if I've, people have heard me say this, I took 15 pages of notes during that time period and asked a lot of questions. And we had a lot of debate among staff and, and uh, industry. And we got a lot of phone calls and we got a lot of really good input from people of all parts of the, all sectors of this industry from operators all the way down to people who are selling it on the open market, pipelines and everybody else manufacturing in between. And I think that was a good vibrant debate. I wanted, I wanna say to some people, I think we made the right decision. Now, when it went to negative 38, um, you know, there were some days that was pretty tough and it still is. And that's why I said, I don't think we're finished yet as an industry uh, with some real challenging times. But I do think we, as an agency, made a good decision. Free markets work, and we're watching it work. And Saudi Arabia is realizing they can't manipulate the market as much as they'd like to because of Texas and, and Texas markets and the United States being a real important part of the international market. Neither can Russia manipulate the markets either. And so that's been an important lesson for all of us, but it also means we've got to be very proactive when we look at federal issues, when we're voting this next cycle, which I'll get into in a, in a little bit, and, and how we look at the world going forward. So everybody was looking at Texas, whether it was Canada, and they're good partners with us. We're glad to have Canada in the North American market. We had a lot of conversations with them, as well as other states uh, in and around Texas, North Dakota, Oklahoma, North, New Mexico, Louisiana, everybody was watching, but they also, we all I think we all realized that free markets work. So as we move past the proration conversation, where are we today? Because I think that's the real key and where are we going forward? So I always have, you know, some of you have watched me speak, I like the numbers. So we were, before we were, before we hit uh, January, we're producing about 4.1 to 4.2 million barrels of oil a day, depending on the numbers and who you looked at. Today, we're at 3.8 million barrels a day. We're only down 9%, which I think is pretty significant how we have weathered and survived this industry and, this, and the ups and downs uh, in the last six months. And we're only off one, just over one and a half percent in the amount of natural gas we're producing. I think that, I mean, that's up uh, a, a little bit. We were down as low as about 5% off. We're now only down just almost just under 2%, between one and a half, two percent And we're off in, in natural gas liquids and condensate about two and a half percent. So we've weathered. We are not down as much as we all thought we would be. I think that uh, says a lot for this industry. But where we're all down, and I think if those of you who look and we now have a disconnect between the number of rigs we have running and the number of permits and the volume we produce in the state, so we're off 70% in the number of rigs we have running in the state. That's huge. That's huge in the state, huge in the country. And what that means for an agency is it means we're off 73% in the number of drilling permits we're issuing. So for those of you who watched my budget, and I know towns, we've had those conversations more than a few times in the last few years about what we do with our budget. This is a big deal for us as an agency and our budgeting numbers. And, um, and so we're trying to figure out how we survive as an agency 
being off 73% in our, in our drilling permit numbers. That being said, we're holding our own as an agency overall in our budget. Um, we are gonna be down though. We are down because we just aren't drilling. And I don't know as we come out of this in a year, 18 months, whatever that time frame looks like, this will look different. And until we get recovery, now if anybody who was out this last weekend or for Labor Day, if you live in Austin, we all believe the world has ended and that we aren't moving around. But if you're outside of Austin and you're out in smaller communities, nobody, nothing changed much because of COVID and people are out driving around. What we aren't doing enough is flying yet, but out driving around and we're beginning to see the demand side creep up just a little bit and that will help this industry a lot. We've got a ways to go though. Uh, because what we've seen in the last few months is obviously we had demand side crater and too much surplus and it will take if you believe in the numbers and I you know you've got to look at the predict predictions it'll take us a year to 18 months to climb out assuming demand continues to recover that's better we're, we're only down to 95 million barrels a day instead of 85 million barrels a day like we were in the height of May but um, but we are recovering slowly in demand, but we've got a, way, a ways to go to use up all of the supply side that we had. A hurricane this past week didn't, you know, helped a little bit as far as the, the, um, the numbers have gone down a little bit because you had some shut-ins. You also had, um, coming off the, the Louisiana and Texas coast, you had people quit refining and the refineries are, are shut for temporarily as well. So. There's there a lot of market driven forces as we keep moving forward. I want to touch for a minute, and I know Jason's got a whole list of questions, but I'm going to touch for a minute kind of where we've been since proration. Look, we're not just focused because while proration was and continues to be a conversation that we need to make sure we're aware of market across the board. What we were focused on before we started this and continue to focus on is flaring was one of the issues. Thank you all very much as an association for being involved in that conversation and for giving us comments on our, um, our new pay, our new forms. Um, we're, look, we're looking at those and we'll make any adjustments that we feel like we ought to make. Um, and hopefully within the next, maybe as early as our September meeting, but definitely by October, we will and move that process forward and change that form and make it a more vibrant process for flaring and get more information. Look, flaring, as much as we'd all like to believe some issues are going away as this industry's down, this is not one of those issues that is not going away. In fact, I think we're seeing environmental groups and other groups that are money managers and other groups really focus on flaring, not just haven't been for the short term, but for the long term. And, my office actually has been talking about this for a good year, about what we do and how we do it better. And I appreciate Wayne uh, Christian being one of the leaders, putting his Blue Ribbon Task Force together to look at what we do, but it's all about the data. A big piece of what everybody wants is our data. And that leads us to the challenge we still have at this agency, which is our IT process. And so as of the end of February, we had $25 million for this biennium to put into IT and, and upgrade this system, knowing that we've got probably a 60 plus million dollar project in front of us to get off the mainframe and the Fortran. Yes, we've been talking about it for a while, but to actually move that process along. And so we're in the middle of a $25 million uh, up part of the upgrade right now. Uh, you'll begin to see some results as we get in further into this next year. But we've seen, we've, we have realized it's allowed us as an agency to continue to function. And so those of you know that I've been talking about IT since I've been, before I got to this agency, it's been important. But I'll give you a couple of examples why when we shut down for COVID on March 17th and we are beginning to open back up slowly, we haven't closed in some places. If you're in Wichita Falls, I don't think anybody ever went home and we never quit inspecting by the way. But, you know, all things go back to Austin, good or bad. And so Austin's been closed officially as an agency um, to go into the office. But about 18% of our people have been going back in anyway. Uh, we are realizing that we now can begin to open up a little bit more despite our crazy mayor. And yes, I like Adler, but we have a city council that doesn't quite get what's going on in the real world. And so 
by the end of this month of September, our intent is to open up at 25% all voluntary in Austin and, um, and continue to open up so we can get back to, back to real work. But that being said, we're more efficient with our drilling permits. We're more efficient with our inspections. We're actually more efficient as an agency and we chalk a lot of that up to the IT improvements we've already done. So if you'll go back just eight years when I got to this agency, some of you might remember, it was taking about 45 to 60 days to get a drilling permit out of this agency and that was expedited. Today and even before COVID for us, and the downturn that we're in right now, it took about two days. And that's because we've upgraded the IT and that's been a real improvement. We've got inspectors that can go out and do their job without having to hand fill out everything. And about 90% of our forms are now online. When I got to this agency, we had none online. So we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go though. And everybody wants our data. And so that's part of what our priority is gonna be long-term and short-term is make this, the website and our data more transparent and make us more efficient as an agency long term. And so the IT program and upgrade will continue. And that is going to be part of our challenge as we go into this next session. So I said, as I started out by saying we're down as an agency, we're off 73% in the number of drilling permits. That puts us off roughly five to $8 million. We're, we're just finishing up a biennium. So we'll see kind of what came in in the last month or finishing up year one of the biennium. We'll see what kind of came in at the end of this month, this past month. Um, that we're off that much already this in the first year. We expect to be off double to triple that in the, in the second year of the biennium, which puts us somewhere between 15 to $23 million off as an agency. Um, we hope to recover some, but that's kind of where we are today. And I say that's, that's big for us. We're only a $76 million a year agency. And so those of you who pay fees, I'm not for raising fees. That is not the intent, but it's figuring out how we go back into this legislature and remind them that we're the most important agency that exists in the entire state. We've already had our 29,000 person Zoom and everybody knows that we're the economic driver of the state. Whether you talk to the controller's numbers or you look at any, any number for the budget for the state, oil and gas, was and still is about 35% of this state's dri economic driver. And so raising fees, changing severance taxes, doing anything to this agency tweaks it and affects the overall budget. And that's gonna be our real challenge this next cycle is to remind people. And so as y'all are out having conversations with your local legislators, remind people how important we are and whether you like oil and gas like some part of the world doesn't, or you really do like oil and, or you, you do or don't. This state understands that oil and gas and energy is an important part of this state, and that is a real driver for people to vote, interestingly. And so as we go into this next cycle, and then Jason, I'm gonna let you ask all your questions in a second. But as we go in this next cycle, I'd like to remind you to vote please, first and foremost, and I voted in a runoff, you can go in, put your mask on, and it's safe to vote or do it by mail. Whatever you do, you need to vote. And as we're looking at the difference between where we are on the federal level when Obama walked out the door versus where we are today, we have a president who we were on the phone during the spring quite a few times with the White House Department of Energy and other Washington Department, Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of State, other parts of this administration who understand and appreciate the oil and gas industry, that it's economic security for this country, and frankly, it's national security, versus a presidential candidate on the other side of the aisle who basically said he's gonna ban fracking, and that's who his advisors are, despite the fact that he keeps backing up. So that's the wave that we're, we're looking at. You either ban fracking and ban oil and gas in this country, which is the job creator for the entire country, quite frankly, or you stay with a, a good Republican president who, look, some days she want him to just say, go sit over in the corner. We appreciate what you're doing and don't tweet all the time, right? But he's doing a good job, understands that job and job creation is important to this country and that the energy industry is a huge piece of that for, for all of us. So, um, and I say that up and down the ballot as we go forward, really, I would, 
whether you've decided or not, go look at what the stance is for every candidate on energy, because if they're not for energy and pro-energy, then I think there's a real problem for all of us up and down the ballot. So with that, Jason, I'm going to stop and, and thank you for having me and I'll answer whatever questions you've got. Well, thank you very much. You, you, you covered nearly everything, so I'm going to have to drill down on, on a few items, though. But uh, uh, thank you again for the reminder to go vote. Uh, we had Chairman Patty on a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying, go vote, but also fill out your census, too, if you haven't done it yet. So uh, uh, both uh, very important notes. Thank you for that. Um, uh, let's go back to flaring. Um, uh, hot topic still. The, the commission presented some striking numbers on how flaring has decreased during the shutdowns, uh, more so than we would otherwise see with a drop in production. And, and again, thank you so much for your leadership to champion more data and more tools for both the commission and operators. And you've regularly noted how the commission has utilized this downturn in activity coupled with ongoing infrastructure improvements to implement better practices and put us in a good position when activity returns. Can you talk about those data points that commission is, is seeing improve? Well, so one, we're obviously seeing just overall flaring numbers go down and that and, and the volumes go down. And part of that we attribute to ourselves and, and I will say what we've been looking at for the last year, year and a half, frankly, that's been staff driven as an agency before we ever got to this point is they've been really looking at, you know, you come in and you say, I want to flare 5,000 MCF a day. And we say, okay, and you've gotten an administrative, uh, I'm going to give you an example. You've gotten an administrative approval for a flaring permit, but after 180 days, obviously those expire and you've got to come in and ask again. And those have been going to hearing as they've been going to hearing. So say you come back in and you say, I still want to flare 5,000 MCF a day. And, but you've only been flaring say 3,000 MCF. In the hearings process, our hearings and, uh, administrators have been cutting that back and looking at what are real numbers, right? So, you know, you get Rystad numbers and, and I've asked the Rystad people in a public forum, I'm like, where do you get your numbers? And they estimate up, by the way. Um, and, but they'll look at our numbers of what the initial flaring permit was of 5,000 MCF, but say you, the operator, really only flaring 3,000 MCF. So what we've tried to do in the last six, eight, 18 months, give or take, in our agency is try to get a better hold on what those real numbers are and not give you a, a bigger permit number than you really need. One, it counts against you. It can, and it really, if you don't need that much, why are we giving you that, that big of a volume of permit? So that's important, I think. And we've been doing that. People don't realize that for the last year, year and a half. And we'll, we will continue to do that. But I do think it's also, we've been looking at, and again, it's about numbers for people as far as, you know, we're hearing about ESG, that's all big companies are talking about and investment groups are kind of talking about too. And so we want to be aware of what those flare points really are. Uh, we Part of what we want to make sure, and we've worked some with TCQ in the last year because we realized our data don't always match and that we don't always know what they're regulating versus what we are when you're looking at flare points as well. And so that's part of the reason on this new data sheet, we've got more specific uh, information about where you are mapping wise, right? So we really do know where you are. Um, so we can attribute flaring, if there's flaring issues, we can attribute it to a specific site. Look, there are places that we know are having flaring, potential flaring issues that maybe they really aren't getting a permit. We need to know that we're gonna come find you and we're gonna make sure that we do an enforcement action against you. But I think overall people are, are doing a good job. We wanna make sure we know what's really going on out in the field. Well, that's perfect. And, and how you do that is, is making sure you have a, a, a budget and the personnel uh, uh, to do those jobs. And it's always top of mind for you at the commission, but also for our, our partners at TCQ. I, um, I, I wanted to see, will we have an appropriations request soon? And, and what are you anticipating for the commission in this upcoming session? Well, you know, the legislature's a little behind. So normally we would have voted on that in August. Um, you will see us vote on September the 22nd. Uh, we will vote on our budget request. And so 
because the legislature never gave us a baseline and we were part in um, in June, they came back and asked for cuts across the board for agencies. We are one of those agencies who are making those cuts. We were at, we're not exempted. We're part of it, and we've been able to do that with cost savings and um, just not. We quit hiring people. We're back to not hiring people, not buying trucks. We've not stopped on the IT piece though, because it's still a, a huge priority for us. So we've done a year one of those budget uh, those budget cuts with cost savings, but as we get into year two, and look, I have to make an assumption today that those those budget cuts remain at least at the numbers they are, if they don't find more that we need all need to do, depending on how the Texas budget recovers long-term overall. And so we're looking at where we, where we continue to find savings and where we make cuts. And so look, we're today at basically 840 people well, I'm going to go back to just 2014-15 and remind some of you where we were at that point. Last downturn, a long time ago, but doesn't isn't that long ago. Um, we quit, you know, we cut people, we quit hiring people at that point. We have not fired anybody. We quit hiring people. That was that was how we were managing through the 14-15 downturn. And at that point, as we started to come out, we were at 650 people. It took us till December of 2019 to get to 840 people with our ability to hire almost 900 people. So, and nobody's retiring anymore. We've only got 10% of our people eligible to retire anymore. In 1415, it was almost 50% of our people. So we're not gonna, I don't want anybody to retire. That'd be Bill Black, who a bunch of y'all know is my chief staff. I don't want Bill Black to retire. Leslie Savage, there's some real key people at this agency. They're not allowed to retire, by the way. But um, but we've got, you know, the, the handful of retirements are good quality people. And people, you know, the articles have been in the last few weeks, if you've been reading them, as this industry slimmed down again, how do we, as we want to ramp back up, where do you find the personnel? And people's always our biggest challenge. And industry always pays more than we do. And finding good quality people is a real challenge for us. So we've not really lost anybody in the last six, seven months. One, there's no jobs to go to. And two, we, I guess we're finally paying at least commiserate the, with no job program over here, but we don't want to lose good quality people. That takes us a long time to gear back up. And then we've got to train everybody and it really causes some gaps for us. So we're trying to maintain our agency as, as much as possible. And that's what our budget goal is for this next cycle is to maintain our agency, maintain our budget, um, and make sure we continue to move the IT process along because we had, we had a commitment to keep it moving forward. And frankly, if you stop, it costs you more on the long run. So we'd, we, we'd like to get our IT project done within six to eight years, depending on how, how we move forward. And for most of y'all, you're, if you're operating in other states, we are using um, Groundwater Protection Council in their uh, their baseline for uh, a lot of our IT as we're moving forward. So you'll see it in New Mexico and Oklahoma and North Dakota. 17 other states are using a lot of their data and their data sets and how they put their data together. And so it'll be something you've seen before, which would be nice, I think. So that so our budget will but we um, we'll see it at the end of this month. Uh, and so our goal is again to maintain where we are. We're not asking for huge growth. We're just asking to maintain. And that's a big deal for us as an agency to maintain our people too. Absolutely. And the commission has a proven track record on IT improvements and on well plugging. And, and the legislature really recognized that last session with some substantial investments uh, to your current budget. Can, can, you share, can you share some progress uh, that you've made there on, on well plugging? And you already mentioned the Groundwater Protection Council, but, but maybe on well plugging. So well plugging, as you know, has been a priority for the last several years for us as an agency. Uh, two years ago, we got about $36 million and plugged just over 3,000 wells in the biennium. And interestingly, we ended up with 6,000 wells again, which is where we started. And so that's kind of, so I feel like we're running in place and this is the well plugging program that we all know has kind of been in place since 1999-2000 partly funded by bond dollars, partly funded by fees and dollars we get in as an agency. Um, so you're right, the legislature gets well plugging. They don't may not understand anything else we do, but they understand well plugging. 
And look, it's a priority for us to continue to plug wells. So this biennium, we were tasked to plug 1,400 wells a year. We actually will meet that metric for year one. Uh, and we've cleaned up just over 200 sites in the state as well, which was our metric to meet. Um, the challenge is as we go into this next year, we hope to continue to meet those metrics. That continues to be a priority for us. But again, we've got to have dollars available to, to be able to do that. And so if you're looking at where you do some cuts, where are the places that we have any opportunity to cut? It's well plugging priorities. Uh, and look, we've, we've got one in the Bay right now, to be really honest, that not the one that you read about in Corpus, but another one we've been working on that we're $3 million in. We always say, you know, you plug something in the water and it costs a lot. We're $3 million in and counting um, because that we don't want any environmental problems and that's a priority for us. So, um, so well plugging is one of the places we have a little bit of flexibility in the budget, you know, personnel, and then you get IT. There's not a lot of flexibility in our budget, but well plugging continues to be a priority. And we, we will ask for those dollars again. Um, we are about at the same, same place we have been. As many wells as we plug, we seem to acquire that many. And historically, when you look at a downturn, we always have more wells come on our books during a downturn. So what we're doing today is basically wells that we got on our books after the 1415 cycle that we continue to go out, we do inspections and prioritize those wells. We are doing more master contracts. So instead of bidding out four wells at a time, we're now bidding, you know, maybe 50 wells at a time, up to 50 wells or something at a time. We're finding that that's better for us budget wise. We can um, use our dollars better and, and, um, and that's been smarter for us long-term. So um, we've got, look, we've got every well planned out. If we had a hundred million or $120 million, we have every well planned out that we have on our books today, how to get it plugged, right? But the reality is we've continued to prioritize those wells and we've got a good group of people who go out and manage that well plugging program. Well, thank you for that. You, you touched on this a, a little earlier about the contrast between the two administrations that, that you served at the Railroad Commission during uh, uh, four years during President Obama's second term, but, but uh, four years for, with President Trump. But can, can you contrast those a little bit and just kind of reemphasize uh, uh, to our members what you've seen at the Railroad Commission? So it's a great question. And remember, we're talking about oil and gas today, but you've got to remember, we, we regulate coal and pipelines. And, and so when we were looking at the Obama administrations, they walked out the door. We were watching as an agency can, with our whole portfolio, we were watching 100, basically 146 rules and regulations that the Obama administration had proposed and or put in place that would be on top of what we were already doing as an agency or partly with TCQ with clean water, clean air issues, right? So, and public utility commission, the three of us all, all work together on certain issues. When they, this administration today walked in the door, they basically wiped everything off but about eight uh, rules and regulations. And today with w them redoing rules and regulations, we're down to four. That's all we're watching. And look, it's methane, it's clean air, it's clean water. These are big rules and regulations. Um, but the difference really is this. Today, we actually have a conversation on a regular basis with EPA, which is amazing to me, right? I mean, EPA's now, you never want to talk to EPA. Some of us still don't, but you don't want to always talk to EPA. But the, the regional director here in Texas, who's region six, comes to Austin, wants to have conversations with us. And that goes all the way up to EPA administration, Department of Energy. We have conversations with them, not just when Rick Perry was there, who that would have been easy for some mm -hmm. of us, right? But also obviously with our, the secretary, with Dan today, with the US Secretary of State's office who sees opportunity with energy across the world, with this White House, we have a lot of, we have conversations back and forth and they get the difference between a heavy federal government putting their, their foot on the state versus letting states do their job and letting us do a good job. We've had a lot of history and experience 
doing a good job at the Railroad Commission, but I think that's true for most state agencies. They get working with states instead of telling us what to do, and that's a big difference as far as working between administrations. And, and so as I watch what the, the Biden ticket is running on, look, it's the Green New Deal. Um, whether he wants to say it or not, that's who's giving him, that's who's giving him advice in the energy space and AOC is, and they do not like this industry. They don't like energy, I don't think, but if you wanna look at the challenge was we could have across the country, just go over to California, who thought the last you know, few months that they were gonna just skip and go to clean energy. Look, I'm all for clean energy in the state. We have a lot of windmills sitting out in West Texas. That's great. We've got solar, that's great too. We're in a high growth state. We need energy of all kinds, but coal, which is 30% of our grid on any given day, and natural gas are really important. And if not, you know, put California times two over here because we actually use air conditioning in this state and mm -hmm. they don't all the time. And, and I will say the Public Utility Commission and ERCOT are doing a good job managing our grid too. So we've all got to figure out how to work together. And that's where the Biden administration doesn't know or appreciate, I don't believe, energy at all and doesn't appreciate where we've really moved. If you look for liquid natural gas, we're now permitting liquid natural gas uh, terminals all over the country. We're building pipelines all over the country and not fighting trying to get a permit across a, you know, a FERC permit or, or a, US, a permit from the U.S. Secretary of State's office across our borders. They appreciate Mexico. Now, Mexico's got some challenges with their leadership today, but they, we do a lot of business with Mexico and they're an important part of, uh, of our energy industry as well. So I think that's the difference when you're looking at, you know, this is not, I would say this isn't Democrats of old who used to sit at the Railroad Commission who liked oil and gas. These are Democrat, the new progressive Democrats who don't want oil and gas at all. They really want it to go away and think we can do it with solar and wind. And that's, not reality, and I don't think that's good economics long term. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's what we're seeing, um, uh, where it's not just overburdensome regulation and stifling innovation, things that um, uh, I guess we could live with, but now we're seeing folks call for the end of domestic oil and gas production and embracing the Green New Deal and other far left policies. And, that disconnect just seems to be growing wider and when petroleum energy is necessary for modern life and economics, these extreme voices seem to be winning out. They do. And I don't, I mean, extreme on either side doesn't work anyway, but like I had people protest my house about a month ago uh, about pipelines. And, and I think that it's incumbent upon all of us as an industry and frankly, as this agency, it's why IT is important to us. It, to be more transparent, to work within communities and make sure we're communicating with where we're operating and what we're doing. And I think this industry is doing a much better job than we used to. Frankly, we were, we've had some challenges and, and, but people don't understand how important this industry is to, to this state, to a community, and frankly, to the, to the economics of the entire country. And I think that's where this, this administration gets it he gets the job growth, but it's really about national security too. Look, he picked up the phone and had conversations with Saudi Arabia and Russia. And I'm not, when we were going through um, in April, and I'm not sure that any other president's done that maybe in my lifetime to try to, to level out this industry. So you didn't see a domestic ener energy industry really uh, go away. He realizes how important it is. And so I, he was in the Midland Odessa area, the president was about a month ago and he, I got to meet him and he, he's an interesting guy anyway, not at all what you think on TV most of the time. He's very thoughtful and very smart. And so I said to him, you know, I'm at the Royal Commission. He looked at me and he goes, 10 million barrels. He goes, we save the energy industry. And I went, yes, sir. It was a, you had a big piece of that to keep us alive as an energy industry. And so what I don't want to have happen is a different administration who doesn't understand this industry come in, especially as we're in a downturn, I don't think we ever recover. I think this industry, this administration and the, and the Republican world really appreciate this energy industry 
and want to see us recover with fair, consistent regulations and transparency and, and us continue to have opportunity for job growth and innovation long term. Well, Commissioner Craddock, thank you for the, the extra time today. We held you a little bit longer and, and your great insights on the upcoming session. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts before we let you go? Now I want to say thank you very much. Look, we've done a lot of things this, this spring and that are continuing as far as giving people opportunity for more time for filing and for other things. If you've got an issue and are trying to really um, to work with us, we want to work with you too. So please pick up the phone and call my office. We've got, look, we've got exemptions obviously through this year, but this industry is important and part of our job is to make sure we're responsive to y'all and work with you so you will be here for the next the next generation so Sai, it's nice to have the second generation i too am second generation i'd like to see the third generation be around too so and the fourth as we go forward so thank you all for having me today i appreciate the time thank you commissioner very much we'll let you go Perfect. Well, Commissioner Craddock can be found on the web at christycraddock.com and on social media uh, for, for all platforms. And a many thanks again to our President's Forum sponsors, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Marathon Oil. If you are interested in sponsoring future events, we want to hear from you. We've got a great one coming up. The Spotlight on the Issues webinar series will be back October 6th with Jason Isaac and the Life Powered Initiative from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Please be sure to fill out the exit survey so we can make these events even better. Have a great day. Thank you.